Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is a stand-up comedian, a comedy writer, a children's author, author. She's on our TV screens all the time, including on quite serious programs like Question Time, where she's a powerful and often fiery voice because she has, in her own words, since birth, been afflicted by being northern. Rosie Jones, welcome to Ways to Change the World. <laughs> Hello, it is so happy in northern. You do not know how hard it is. <laughs> well, I do because I grew up in the north as well, but I mean, I, in a different part, I grew up in Lancashire and oh, you grew up in Yorkshire, yeah, which is the great yeah. divide, obviously. Yeah, I- Actually, my mum and dad are from Manchester, so when they had a baby born in bloody Yorkshire, that they hated that, and they never forgive themselves for not driving over the pennant. <laughs> Now, your career is just extraordinary at the moment. I mean, it's taken off massively over the last couple of years, especially given you only really went into stand-up comedy relatively recently, a few years ago. I think there's a number of reasons why. So one factor was before I was a comic, I worked in telly which was such a good way to learn how panel shows work, what is needed for a comedian and what producers look for in the edit. Even the early ones, like... I think the first thing I did was eight out of ten cats and I'd only been doing stand-up for four months and they say it's who you know and it is to an extent like it's Definitely because I used to work on 8 out of 10 cats. They already felt confident in my comedy. So whereas a lot of open mic and new stand-ups, it takes them a few years to... Uh, really hone their voice and get seen by the right people. I was lucky enough that the right people were my mates or my old bosses. So that's one factor. And another factor is... I am a woman, I am disabled, I am gay and I'm a massive advocate for all of those things in my stand-up. I talk about that and I talk about how proud I am to be all of my millions of labels and I think when I was starting three, four years ago it, there's a hunger for different voices which was amazing so luckily when I came on the stand up scene people were like oh well I've 
And, and you've said many times that, you know, you are now living the dream. You know, you're having an amazing time. And it's really obvious because you're, you know, you're, obvi- you're just so excited and happy whenever I see you on the telly and in real life. And, um, but I just wonder whether, you know, the, the intersectionality that you talk about of, of being disabled and gay and a woman in, in you know, a, a male dominated industry. Um, does the success and the charm that you're enjoying now... Does it come after a period of discrimination and difficulty, or have you always been in the right place at the right time? I can't explain it without it sounding like I had a horrible upbringing. I absolutely didn't. I love my parents. I had an idyllic childhood by the seaside. But when I go over that time as an adult, I grew up in a small seaside town where everyone knew me. I was already a celebrity, but they knew me because I was a disabled one. I was a different one. So then when I became a teenager and I started having feelings for girls and women, Growing up in that seaside town, I was like, well, I can't be the gay one. I'm already the disabled one. So although I've never received homophobia or that direct ableism to my face. I grew up in a town and a society where I knew I was different and I was made to feel different and to team that up with the media where I never saw a disabled person on telly who was happy. You know, growing up in the 90s, if there was a disabled person on telly, there'd always be the bit him or the angelic creature and I'm not I'm not a victim I got many many flaws so as an adult I can now understand that I've grown up in quite a tight world that didn't allow me to be a hundred percent 
who I was. I wonder what whether you think that um, you know the industry is more open to more people who are disabled, or have they ticked the box? Have they have they said we've got Rosie, we don't need any more? Um, you know, so is it really a time of opportunity for people who are disabled right now in the media uh, and in comedy in particular, or? you know, have enough been let in um, for them to say, well, we've done that, which I think is partly what happened with, with things like race, um, you know, in the in, in the 80s and 90s, you know, that some of us got in and then a lot of people in the industry went, well, we've done that. It's interesting and a joke and this podcast for me might sound a bit hollow. Because I'm currently sat in a very empty flat because I just bought my first flat and I joke that I've bought it on the money of panel shows because I've done them all, I have, and Unfortunately, yeah, when I do do a panel show, I'm always the only disabled person on the episode. But unfortunately, I'm usually the only disabled person on that whole series. So... Although it helped me be a homeowner, like, we need to be better. But that is then so tricky because I got opportunities before my able-bodied colleagues because I had that diversity. So I say that my disability does open more doors, but it's up to me to stay in the rooms. And for me, it's a big thing when I'm invited back on a panel show because that means yet yeah, the first time might be a diversity booking but if I do my job right it's because of me and my talent that I'm invited back The problem we have right now is people are so hungry to book diverse people, which is great, but it means that the pool of diverse comedians including me, were knackered because they're pushing us to do everything. And my slight concern is that if you just keep using that tiny group, they're going to exhaust themselves and retire at 35. But also from an audience point of view, they're going to get bored of the same people. I'm very aware that uh, some days of the week, I got my mug on BBC One, ITV and Channel 4 at the same time. 
and not even my own mother enjoys that. So it's now about showing the seeds and you nurturing, you talent, you diverse people, disabled people, hopefully five. 10, 15 years, a comedy world will be so fresh of brilliant, diverse comedians who haven't been rushed and they're not bloody naked. I, I always want to ask you about um, your cerebral palsy and your speech because does it give you actually a bit of an advantage in that your thoughts are going much faster than your words. Yeah. So you're a little bit ahead of the game. I speak slowly, but my mind is like everyone else's. So I kind of describe my mind as a editor. And while I'm talking, my mind is going, do we need that word? No. That word? No. I've got no time to walk for on if my mind is doing the job right. Hopefully, a lot of things I say are necessary. And and in terms of the kinds of things you're doing, because you 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 know, you've done straight acting and comedy acting and writing. I mean, are you basically just doing anything that comes that seems appealing? Or is there is there sort of method in the madness? <laughs> Absolutely no method in the madness. This might change as my career progresses, but basically, right now, I do the jobs I want to do. And I think I've got a few comedian friends who have heroes, and they might be uh, Victoria Wood, Billy Connolly, uh, Julia Davies, and they will look at their careers and go, right, what did they do? All right, so Billy did some straight acting, or oh, Julia Davies doesn't do panel shows. But I'm not Victoria Wood, I'm not Billy Connolly, and I'm not Julia David. Although they're my heroes, I don't want a carbon copy of their careers. So right now, if I want to do five episodes of Casualty, I'll do them. If I want to write a kid's book, I'll do it. If I want to um, share my political opinions and question time, yes, Please. And and are you enjoying more being able to use comedy to get points over and to make people think? Because you're, you're, you're very, very direct. You always have been about disability, about the elephant in the room, you know, whatever it might be. And you've played around with those ideas. But, you know, are you now seeing comedy as, a re, as quite a powerful tool? When I started out, I... I made a point of saying I don't speak 
for all disabled people, all, all gay people, or all, all women that speak for me. This is the life and the world from my eyes. And that is very much still the case. But as my career has progressed, I need to recognise that I've been given a platform that not a lot of other disabled people have. So I think I'll be doing myself a disservice if I didn't tackle the wider picture and say, look, during the pandemic, six out of ten people who died at the beginning of the virus had a disability, like, why is unemployment double in disabled people compared to able-bodied people? These are things that I think people need to be aware of in order to change and become a better world. So it's that combination of, yet I don't speak for all diversities, but I can give us a voice. But then, at the same time, I'm still a silly comedian, so... Sometimes I'll go on stage and I'll talk about what, how the government is failing all disabled people. And then sometimes I'll go on stage and talk about how boring my mum and dad are so we just getting that balance and going I got a platform and gonna use it for good but at the same time I'm not a politician I'm also here to tell a few stupid jokes and what do you think about this thing that seems to have happened during the pandemic where, you know, we, we're clearly living in a time where the media in particular want to raise the profile of disability, to recognise how many of us have disabilities um, and to change perceptions. But at the same time, we've had this whole thing of, well, the people dying have all got underlying illnesses, so you can write them off. Um, you know, I wonder whether you think, you know, have... have have attitudes towards disability in some ways gone backwards during the pandemic? Yeah, it definitely did. And I think it's because a pandemic made disabled people feel more disabled. And that's a number of things. From my point of view, I live in London on my own, but when lockdown happened, I went straight to live with my mum and dad, and I stayed there for nearly a year because although I am not high risk, Things that I do in terms of going to the shops because of my mobility, I need to touch everything. Um, I wear a mask, but often people can't understand 
Stand me on the red shadow now. I am an independent woman. The pandemic meant that my mum and dad had to look after me. And when you take that to other disabled people, People who have carers, just that, that whole thing was made worse in the pandemic and a lot of disabled people couldn't get out so felt very isolated and then coming out of the pandemic when a lot of people are unemployed and looking for work, again, that's made harder if you are disabled. So, also, no one talks about this and... For ages, I've thought about Me Too and Black Lives Matter and such important movements. But nobody during those movements really talked about the experiences of disabled women or disabled people of colour and say disabled people are all put in their own box. And, and all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I really think we need a movement for disabled people. But do you think there's been an implicit undervaluing or devaluing of disabled people during the pandemic through all the language of, well, of those people who died, X percent of them had underlying conditions? Yeah, and that made me so angry at the beginning because uh, the government made out like, it was okay. Like, oh, don't worry. It's only people with underlying health conditions. But if you reword that just slightly, you are saying, oh, don't worry. It's just disabled people. I get a lot of hate on Twitter and on social media because of my political beliefs. I am incredibly left-leaning and I do think it's our government who time and time again just overlooks and ignores disabled people. Why are you left-leaning? That, that's such a simple question and part of me is I want to answer by saying because I'm clever because I got a brain, but it's mainly because I believe that everyone should be treated equally and as people. And I definitely, since we've had a Tory government, I've seen um, the lives of disabled people get worse. I certainly had my benefits cut immediately. And that was 
moneda I depended on in terms of getting taxes, being less tired. My life is harder now and I really think I went to school um, when Labour were in charge and that meant I got the money and the care and support to really get a good education. You, you mentioned the abuse you get on social media and you, you do publicise it. Even the week we're speaking, you put something on Twitter about the reaction to you playing a pregnant character in Casualty. Do you think it helps you publicising it? Do you think it does good? So I get trolls, I get abuse every day and... 99% of the time I ignore it and I got a very thick skin and I go, right, you're, you're another sad little person trying to make themselves feel better. But... Oh, I got a particularly horrible comment on one of my pictures and I thought about it a lot and I thought people need to know that I get this every day. I'm sure you won't want you know, the people who send it to get the satisfaction of knowing that it hurts. But it must hurt. Weirdly, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I had a lot of friends texting me going, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, fine. If I'm honest, how okay I am, it's a little bit worrying because now I'm numb to it. I mean, imagine a world in which those trolls could listen and think and maybe change their behaviour. What would you want to say to them? That's interesting because... I would want to talk to them individually because I reckon they've all got their different stories. They've all got their reasons for saying it. But um, if I spoke to all of them collectively, I just say, are you okay? How can I make you happy? Because a happy person doesn't write that. Can I just change the subject for a moment? I just wanted to ask you as well about your view on uh, on on acting. Um, there's been a lot of stories again recently about portrayal, about who gets to portray what you know, whether it's religion or disability or race. You know, how do you feel about non-disabled people playing disabled parts? And do you think more parts that are intended as able-bodied parts should be played by disabled people? I 100% do not agree with non-disabled actors playing disabled characters because in 2022 we are better than that and I just think it's frankly awful that someone could pretend to be disabled. There's so many factors to this. 
Unfortunately, even now, the pool of disabled roles is really small. And if I play a character, um, the cerebral palsy is normally a huge factor in it, and it shouldn't be. Um, I played such a great role a few years ago in a BBC daytime drama called Shakespeare and Hathaway, and the character was a ghost hunter, and it was quite a comedy role. And at no point did it mention her disability. Um, obviously, because I played her, Penelope happened to have cerebral palsy uh, because I'm not that good of an actor. The voice always comes with me. So that character was disabled, but because it didn't affect any part of the plot, they didn't even mention it, and that was amazing. And if you think about your own, um, you know, characteristics, if you like, I mean, does that only apply to disability, or do you think, you know, gay actors shouldn't play straight roles, or straight roles shouldn't play, straight actors shouldn't play gay parts? I have this debate with myself a million times over and I think I'm in the wrong and there'll be people listening who will disagree with me. I am sorry. Uh, but I don't think it's the same. I think gay characters can be played by straight actors and gay actors can play straight characters. For example, I'm a 100% gay woman. Um, I'm currently um, in casualty playing a straight pregnant woman. And I can do that because for me it's a lot more of a two-way street. Um, what of course one of my favourite shows last year was It's a Sin. And I know that Russell T. Davis spoke very openly about making sure that all the gay characters were played by gay actors. And I think that that situation I agree with because it's such a powerful and specific story, I think you'd be doing a dishonour if it wasn't played by gay actors. But I think in general, I, in the future, I want to play a character with a husband and children because it's a role, it's somebody, I'm playing somebody who isn't me. We've covered a lot of bases in this chat, but if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? 
It's simple, but I just want people to ask more questions. And that is such a broad thing, but I think a lot of the anger in the world comes from a lack of understanding. And if we were able to go up to people and in a safe environment go, tell me about you. What does that mean? Like with me, when I've had friends for years and it takes a drunken night in the pub for them to go, how did you become disabled? Or do you wish you weren't disabled? And when I answer them, you can see in their eyes, they understand me a little bit more. And that those questions can be as simple as, how are you? And that comes back to the online abuse and the trolls. I read them and I think, does that come because nobody today has said to that person, how are you? Are you okay? So if we were able to ask more questions, I think there would will be a lot more understanding and embrace difference. Rosie Jones, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world. That's been a huge pleasure. Our producer is Nina Hodgson, and you can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye.